Chapter 57 The Ark Taken by the Philistines This chapter is based on 1 Samuel 3 to chapter 7. Another warning was to be given to Eli's house. God could not communicate with the high priest and his sons. Their sins, like a thick cloud, had shut out the presence of his Holy Spirit. But in the midst of evil, the child Samuel remained true to heaven, and the message of condemnation to the house of Eli was Samuel's commission as a prophet of the Most High. The word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. And it came to pass at that time when Eli was laid down in his place, and his eyes began to wax dim, that he could not see. And ere the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was, and Samuel was laid down to sleep, that the Lord called Samuel. Supposing the voice to be that of Eli, the child hastened to the bedside of the priest, saying, Here am I, for thou callest me. The answer was, I call not, my son, lie down again. Three times Samuel was called, and thrice he responded in like manner. And then Eli was convinced that the mysterious call was the voice of God. The Lord had passed by his chosen servant, the man of hoary hairs, to commune with a child. This in itself was a bitter, yet deserved rebuke to Eli and his house. No feeling of envy or jealousy was awakened in Eli's heart. He directed Samuel to answer, if again called, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. Once more the voice was heard, and the child answered, Speak, for thy servant heareth. So awed was he at the thought that the great God should speak to him that he could not remember the exact words which Eli bade him say. And the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I will do a thing in Israel, at which both the ears of every one that heareth it shall tingle. In that day I will perform against Eli all things which I have spoken concerning his house. When I begin, I will also make an end. For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knoweth, because his sons made themselves vile, and he restrained them not. And therefore I have sworn unto the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be purged with sacrifice nor offering forever. Before receiving this message from God, Samuel did not yet know the Lord, neither was the word of the Lord yet revealed unto him. That is, he was not acquainted with such direct manifestations of God's presence as were granted to the prophets. It was the Lord's purpose to reveal himself in an unexpected manner that Eli might hear of it through the surprise and inquiry of the youth. Samuel was filled with fear and amazement at the thought of having so terrible a message committed to him. In the morning he went about his duties as usual, but with a heavy burden upon his young heart. The Lord had not commanded him to reveal the fearful denunciation, hence he remained silent, avoiding as far as possible the presence of Eli. He trembled lest some question should compel him to declare the divine judgments against one whom he loved and reverenced. Eli was confident that the message foretold some great calamity to him and his house. He called Samuel and charged him to relate faithfully what the Lord had revealed. The youth obeyed, and the aged man bowed in humble submission to the appalling sentence. It is the Lord, he said. Let him do what seemeth him good. Yet Eli did not manifest the fruits of true repentance. He confessed his guilt, but failed to renounce the sin. Year after year the Lord delayed his threatened judgments. Much might have been done in those years to redeem the failures of the past, but the aged priest took no effective measures to correct the evils that were polluting the sanctuary of the Lord and leading thousands in Israel to ruin. The forbearance of God caused Hophni and Phinehas to harden their hearts and to become still bolder in transgression. The messages of warning and reproof to his house were made known by Eli to the whole nation. By this means he hoped to counteract in some measure the evil influence of his past neglect. But the warnings were disregarded by the people, as they had been by the priests. The people of surrounding nations also, who were not ignorant of the iniquities openly practiced in Israel, became still bolder in their idolatry and crime. They felt no sense of guilt for their sins, 
as they would have felt had the Israelites preserved their integrity. But a day of retribution was approaching. God's authority had been set aside, and his worship neglected and despised, and it became necessary for him to interpose that the honor of his name might be maintained. Now Israel went out against the Philistines to battle, and pitched beside Ebenezer, and the Philistines pitched in Ophic. This expedition was undertaken by the Israelites without counsel from God, without the concurrence of high priest or prophet. And the Philistines put themselves in array against Israel, and when they joined battle, Israel was smitten before the Philistines. And they slew of the army in the field about four thousand men. As the shattered and disheartened force returned to their encampment, the elders of Israel said, Wherefore hath the Lord smitten us today before the Philistines? The nation was ripe for the judgments of God, yet they did not see that their own sins had been the cause of this terrible disaster. And they said, Let us fetch the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of Shiloh unto us, that when it cometh among us, it may save us out of the hand of our enemies. The Lord had given no command or permission that the ark should come into the army, yet the Israelites felt confident that victory would be theirs, and uttered a great shout when it was borne into the camp by the sons of Eli. The Philistines looked upon the ark as the God of Israel. All the mighty works that Jehovah had wrought for his people were attributed to its power. As they heard the shouts of joy at its approach, they said, What meaneth the noise of this great shout in the camp of the Hebrews? And they understood that the ark of the Lord was come into the camp. And the Philistines were afraid, for they said, God has come into the camp. And they said, Woe unto us, for there hath not been such a thing heretofore. Woe unto us, who should deliver us out of the hand of these mighty gods? These are the gods that smote the Egyptians with all the plagues in the wilderness. Be strong, and quit yourselves like men, O ye Philistines, that ye be not servants unto the Hebrews, as they have been to you. Quit yourselves like men, and fight. The Philistines made a fierce assault, which resulted in the defeat of Israel, with great slaughter. Thirty thousand men lay dead upon the field, and the ark of God was taken, the two sons of Eli having fallen while fighting to defend it. Thus again was left unto the page of history a testimony for all future ages, that the iniquity of God's professed people will not go unpunished. The greater the knowledge of God's will, the greater the sin of those who disregard it. The most terrifying calamity that could occur had befallen Israel. The ark of God had been captured and was in the possession of the enemy. The glory had indeed departed from Israel when the symbol of the abiding presence and power of Jehovah was removed from the midst of them. With this sacred chest were associated the most wonderful revelations of God's truth and power. In former days, miraculous victories had been achieved whenever it appeared. It was shadowed by the wings of the golden cherubim, and the unspeakable glory of the Shekinah, the visible symbol of the Most High God, had rested over it in the Holy of Holies. But now it had brought no victory. It had not proved a defense on this occasion, and there was mourning throughout Israel. They had not realized that their faith was only a nominal faith, and had lost its power to prevail with God. The law of God contained in the ark was also a symbol of his presence. But they had cast contempt upon the commandments, had despised their requirements, and had grieved the Spirit of the Lord from among them. When the people obeyed the holy precepts, the Lord was with them to work for them by his infinite power. But when they looked upon the ark and did not associate it with God, nor honor his revealed will, by obedience to his law, it could avail them little more than a common box. They looked to the ark as the idolatrous nations looked to their gods, as if it possessed in itself the elements of power and salvation. They transgressed the law it contained, for their very worship of the ark led to formalism, hypocrisy, and idolatry. Their sin had separated them from God, and he could not give them the victory until they had repented of and forsaken their iniquity. It was not enough that the ark and the sanctuary were in the midst of Israel. It was not enough that the priests offered sacrifices, and that the people were called the children of God. 
The Lord does not regard the request of those who cherish iniquity in the heart. It is written that he that turneth away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be abomination. Proverbs chapter 28, verse 9. When the army went out to battle, Eli, blind and old, had tarried at Shiloh. It was with troubled forebodings that he awaited the result of the conflict, for his heart trembled for the ark of God. Taking his position outside the gate of the tabernacle, he sat by the highway side day after day, anxiously expecting the arrival of a messenger from the battlefield. At length a Benjamite from the army, with his clothes rent and with earth upon his head, came hurrying up the ascent leading to the city. Passing heedlessly, the aged man beside the way, he rushed on to the town and repeated to eager throngs the tidings of defeat and loss. The sound of wailing and lamentation reached the watcher beside the tabernacle. The messenger was brought to him, and the man said unto Eli, Israel is fled before the Philistines, and there hath been also a great slaughter among the people, and thy two sons also, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead. Eli could endure all this, terrible as it was, for he had expected it. But when the messenger added, And the ark of God is taken, a look of unutterable anguish passed over his countenance. The thought that his sin had thus dishonored God and caused him to withdraw his presence from Israel was more than he could bear. His strength was gone, he fell, and his neck brake, and he died. The wife of Phinehas, notwithstanding the impiety of her husband, was a woman who feared the Lord. The death of her father-in-law and her husband, and above all the terrible tidings that the ark of God was taken, caused her death. She felt that the last hope of Israel was gone and she named the child born in this hour of adversity Ichabod, or Inglorious, with her dying breath mournfully repeating the words, The glory is departed from Israel, for the ark of God is taken. But the Lord had not wholly cast aside his people, nor would he long suffer the exultation of the heathen. He had used the Philistines as the instrument to punish Israel, and he employed the ark to punish the Philistines. In time past the divine presence had attended it to be the strength and glory of his obedient people. That invisible presence would still attend it to bring terror and destruction to the transgressors of his holy law. The Lord often employs his bitterest enemies to punish the unfaithfulness of his professed people. The wicked may triumph for a time as they see Israel suffering chastisement, but the time will come when they too must meet the sentence of a holy, sin-hating God. Wherever iniquity is cherished, there, swift and unerring, the divine judgments will follow. The Philistines removed the ark in triumph to Ashdod, one of their five principal cities, and placed it in the house of their god Dagon. They imagined that the power which had hitherto attended the ark would be theirs, and that this, united with the power of Dagon, would render them invincible. But upon entering the temple on the following day, they beheld a sight which filled them with consternation. Dagon had fallen on his face to the earth before the ark of Jehovah. The priests reverently lifted the idol and restored it to its place. But the next morning they found it, strangely mutilated, again lying on the earth before the ark. The upper part of this idol was like that of a man, and the lower part was in the likeness of a fish. Now every part that resembled a human form had been cut off, and only the body of the fish remained. Priests and people were horror-struck. They looked upon this mysterious event as an evil omen, foreboding destruction to themselves and their idols before the God of the Hebrews. They now removed the ark from their temple and placed it in a building by itself. The inhabitants of Ashdod were smitten with a distressing and fatal disease. Remembering the plagues that were inflicted upon Egypt by the God of Israel, the people attributed their afflictions to the presence of the ark among them. It was decided to convey it to Gath. But the plague followed close upon its removal, and the men of that city sent it to Ekron. Here the people received it with terror, crying, They have brought about the ark of the God of Israel to us to slay us and our people. They turned to their gods for protection, as the people of Gath and Ashdod had done. But the work of the destroyer went on until, in their distress, 
the cry of the city went up to heaven. Fearing longer to retain the ark among the homes of men, the people next placed it in the open field. There followed a plague of mice which infested the land, destroying the products of the soil both in the storehouse and in the field. Utter destruction by disease or famine now threatened the nation. For seven months the ark remained in Philistia, and during all this time the Israelites made no effort for its recovery. But the Philistines were now as anxious to free themselves from its presence as they had been to obtain it. Instead of being a source of strength to them, it was a great burden and a heavy curse. Yet they knew not what course to pursue, for wherever it went the judgments of God followed. The people called for the princes of the nation with the priests and diviners, and eagerly inquired, What shall we do to the ark of Jehovah? Tell us wherewith we shall send it to his place. They were advised to return it with a costly trespass offering. Then, said the priests, ye shall be healed, and it shall be known to you why his hand is not removed from you. To ward off or to remove a plague, it was anciently the custom among the heathen to make an image in gold, silver, or other material of that which caused the destruction, or of the object or part of the body specially affected. This was set up on a pillar, or in some conspicuous place and was supposed to be an effectual protection against the evils thus represented. A similar practice still exists among some heathen peoples. When a person suffering from disease goes for cure to the temple of his idol, he carries with him a figure of the part affected, which he presents as an offering to his God. It was in accordance with the prevailing superstition that the Philistine lords directed the people to make representations of the plagues by which they had been afflicted. Five golden emrods, and five golden mice, according to the number of the lords of the Philistines. For, said they, one plague was on you all and on your lords. These wise men acknowledged a mysterious power accompanying the ark, a power which they had no wisdom to meet. Yet they did not counsel the people to turn from their idolatry to serve the Lord. They still hated the God of Israel, though compelled by overwhelming judgments to submit to his authority. Thus sinners may be convinced by the judgments of God that it is in vain to contend against Him. They may be compelled to submit to His power, while at heart they rebel against His control. Such submission cannot save the sinner. The heart must be yielded to God, must be subdued by divine grace, before man's repentance can be accepted. How great is the long-suffering of God toward the wicked! The idolatrous Philistines and backsliding Israel had alike enjoyed the gifts of his providence. Ten thousand unnoticed mercies were silently falling in the pathway of ungrateful, rebellious men. Every blessing spoke to them of the giver, but they were indifferent to his love. The forbearance of God was very great toward the children of men, but when they stubbornly persisted in their impenitence, he removed from them his protecting hand. They refused to listen to the voice of God in His created works, and in the warnings, counsels, and reproofs of His Word, and thus He was forced to speak to them through judgments. There were some among the Philistines who stood ready to oppose the return of the ark to its own land. Such an acknowledgment of the power of Israel's God would be humiliating to the pride of Philistia. But the priests and the diviners admonished the people not to imitate the stubbornness of Pharaoh, and the Egyptians, and thus bring upon themselves still greater afflictions. A plan which won the consent of all was now proposed and immediately put into execution. The ark, with the golden trespass offering, was placed upon a new cart, thus precluding all danger of defilement. To this cart or car were attached two kine, upon whose necks a yoke had never been placed. Their calves were shut up at home and the cows were left free to go where they pleased. If the ark should thus be returned to the Israelites by the way of Beth Shemesh, the nearest city of the Levites, the Philistines would accept this as evidence that the God of Israel had done unto them this great evil. But if not, they said, then we shall know that it is not his hand that smote us. It was a chance that happened to us. On being set free, the kind turned from their young, and, lowing as they went, took the direct road to Beth Shemesh. Guided by no human hand, 
the patient animals kept on their way. The Divine Presence accompanied the ark, and it passed on safely to the very place designated. It was now the time of wheat harvest, and the men of Beshemesh were reaping in the valley. And they lifted up their eyes and saw the ark and rejoiced to see it. And the ark came into the field of Joshua, a Beshemite, and stood there, where there was a great stone. And they clave the wood of the cart and offered the kine a burnt offering unto the Lord. The lords of the Philistines who had followed the ark unto the border of Beshemesh and had witnessed its reception, now returned to Ekron. The plague had ceased, and they were convinced that their calamities had been a judgment from the God of Israel. The men of Beshemish quickly spread the tidings that the ark was in their possession, and the people from the surrounding country flocked to welcome its return. The ark had been placed upon the stone that first served for an altar, and before it additional sacrifices were offered unto the Lord. Had the worshippers repented of their sins, God's blessing would have attended them. But they were not faithfully obeying His law. And while they rejoiced at the return of the ark as a harbinger of good, they had no true sense of its sacredness. Instead of preparing a suitable place for its reception, they permitted it to remain in the harvest field. As they continued to gaze upon the sacred chest, and to talk of the wonderful manner in which it had been restored, they began to conjecture wherein lay its peculiar power. At last, overcome by curiosity, they removed the coverings and ventured to open it. All Israel had been taught to regard the ark with awe and reverence. When required to remove it from place to place, the Levites were not so much as to look upon it. Only once a year was the high priest permitted to behold the ark of God. Even the heathen Philistines had not dared to remove its coverings. Angels of heaven, unseen, ever attended it in all its journeyings. The irreverent daring of the people at Beshemish was speedily punished. Many were smitten with sudden death. The survivors were not led by this judgment to repent of their sins, but only to regard the ark with superstitious fear. Eager to be free from its presence, yet not daring to remove it, the Beshemites sent a message to the inhabitants of kirjath Jerem inviting them to take it away. With great joy the men of this place welcomed the sacred chest. They knew that it was the pledge of divine favor to the obedient and faithful. With solemn gladness they brought it to their city and placed it in the house of Abinadab, a Levite. This man appointed his son, Eliezer, to take charge of it, and it remained there for many years. During the years since the Lord first manifested himself to the son of Hannah, Samuel's call to the prophetic office had come to be acknowledged by the whole nation. By faithfully delivering the divine warning to the house of Eli, painful and trying as the duty had been, Samuel had given proof of his fidelity as Jehovah's messenger. And the Lord was with him, and did let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan even to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was established to be a prophet of the Lord. The Israelites as a nation still continued in a state of irreligion and idolatry, and as a punishment they remained in subjection to the Philistines. During this time Samuel visited the cities and villages throughout the land, seeking to turn the hearts of the people to the God of their fathers, and his efforts were not without good results. After suffering the oppression of their enemies for twenty years, the Israelites mourned after the Lord. Samuel counseled them, If ye do return unto the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the strange gods and Ashtaroth from among you, and prepare your hearts unto the Lord, and serve Him only. Here we see that practical piety, heart religion, was taught in the days of Samuel as taught by Christ when He was upon the earth. Without the grace of Christ, the outward forms of religion were valueless to ancient Israel. They are the same to modern Israel. There is need today of such a revival of true heart religion as was experienced by ancient Israel. Repentance is the first step that must be taken by all who would return to God. No one can do this work for another. We must individually humble our souls before God and put away our idols. When we have done all that we can do, the Lord will manifest to us His salvation. With the cooperation of the heads of the tribes, a large assembly was gathered at Mizpah. Here a solemn fast was held. With deep humiliation the people confessed their sins, and, as an evidence of their determination to obey the instructions they had heard, 
they invested Samuel with the authority of judge. The Philistines interpreted this gathering to be a council of war, and with a strong force set out to disperse the Israelites before their plans could be matured. The tidings of their approach caused great terror in Israel. The people entreated Samuel, Cease not to cry unto the Lord our God for us, that he will save us out of the hand of the Philistines. While Samuel was in the act of presenting a lamb as a burnt offering, the Philistines drew near for battle. Then the Mighty One, who had descended upon Sinai amid fire and smoke and thunder, who had parted the Red Sea and made a way through Jordan for the children of Israel, again manifested his power. A terrible storm burst upon the advancing host, and the earth was strewn with the dead bodies of mighty warriors. The Israelites had stood in silent awe, trembling with hope and fear. When they beheld the slaughter of their enemies, they knew that God had accepted their repentance. Though unprepared for battle, they seized the weapons of the slaughtered Philistines and pursued the fleeing host to Bethkar. This signal victory was gained upon the very field where, twenty years before, Israel had been smitten before the Philistines, the priests slain, and the ark of God taken. For nations, as well as for individuals, the path of obedience to God is the path of safety and happiness, while that of transgression leads only to disaster and defeat. The Philistines were now so completely subdued that they surrendered the strongholds which had been taken from Israel and refrained from acts of hostility for many years. Other nations followed this example, and the Israelites enjoyed peace until the close of Samuel's sole administration. That the occasion might never be forgotten, Samuel set up between Mizpah and Shen a great stone as a memorial. He called the name of it Ebenezer, the stone of help, saying to the people, Hitherto hath Jehovah helped us.